So I, I told you I would be back. Um, the, the, uh, let me um, let me start by saying that we we um, uh, in this presentation, of course, uh, many of you are familiar with the nuclear nonproliferation regime. We'll uh, hear things that they've already heard. But I thought it was, uh, and when we were preparing the conference with Emily, we thought it was useful also to sort of go back to the history of the regime because this, the regime is a sort of. Uh, pretty well-known story now, but uh, um, of something which is rather exceptional, uh, in the sense that uh, 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 this regime established a system by which a, a, a vast majority of the international community have accepted to abandon the most powerful weapon and to abandon it for good, in the sense that they, they uh, uh, renounce it uh, and now they renounce it since 95 uh, uh, for an indefinite period, which is a very unusual thing if you, if you think about it. Of course, one should never say never, and uh, uh, it is interesting to see that uh, 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 things happen that do change things. Uh, uh, today I just heard that the Pope resigned, uh, which is uh, 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 unexpected and unheard of in 2,000 years of Holy See. So, you can, you can think of uh, uh, things happening that are uh, 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 new. So it's worthwhile looking back on how was this possible and what, was the, what were the success, the failures, and, uh, uh, and, and the shortcomings of this regime as we see it evolve into a, a, some sort of a crisis or many of, you see, many of us see it in, in a sort of crisis currently. Um, I, to do that um, and uh, to look at how the NPT in particular became a central uh, piece of international security, I will try to distinguish four different phases in its uh, rather short history. Um, let me very briefly look at the, I would say, non-proliferation before the NPT to start with, because the norm didn't establish itself uh, uh, in a simple uh, manner. Uh, and uh, one could say that from 1945 to the 60s, I would say, and, and this is, has to do also with the title of this presentation, which focuses on both US and European perspectives, was very much a US obsession only. Um, uh, the, the, uh, as proliferation per se was not regarded as a threat to international security by most of the international community. In the nutshell, the U.S. was denying nuclear technology, uh, um, to, including to its friends and allies, and trying to control the, the use of technology through a variety of means, whether it was the IAEA or, uh, and, uh, 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 and the Atoms for Peace that preceded it. Uh, this policy was rather unique as other players were ready to, to share the benefits at least of civilian nuclear technology, and only had limited constraints about the, and, and concerns about the potential risks associated with military implications. It's interesting to note that in that period, uh, there was a quite in-depth nuclear cooperation between uh, the Soviet Union and China, um, France and Israel, uh, but also between non-nuclear states such as, as Canada <coughs> and India, uh, which uh, led to uh, uh, the spread of nuclear technology, one could say. And those are good examples of a, a mindset prevailing at the time, uh, which is very well described in the early literature about uh, proliferation, which is to say that until the early 60s, the notion that the spread of nuclear technology was a danger uh, to be stopped was not broadly shared by uh, all players. Uh, and I think this is something that is uh, interesting to bear in mind. And for instance, if you look at the French literature of the time, I'm thinking of Bertrand Goldschmidt, who had a very senior position in the French Atomic Energy Commission, who, and who has written extensively in the 60s and 70s about that, he, he does uh, uh, point at that. So we could have been in a very different system, uh, and it's just uh, worthwhile uh, mentioning in a way because it means that we could move to something different as well. Of course, this atmosphere changed in the early 60s for a series of reasons. The first one is that the U.S. administration under Kennedy and Johnson did uh, toughen its stance and began advocating a much more robust regime, uh, partly in fear that allies would follow uh, the um, uh, uh, sort of French path uh, in their quest of the, uh, for the bomb. Uh, and at the time, the, the Americans um, uh, took a series of policy decisions uh, 
which included very open uh, criticism of uh, allies and the, the Kennedy speech you referred to was very much focused on allies more than, than, than on, on, on potential enemies. Uh, uh, to, to the potential risks associated with the multiplication of uh, um, nuclear players within the alliance, within NATO, uh, and beyond, uh, due to the spread of nuclear technology. And, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, and this moved the Americans into something uh, beyond Atoms for Peace and the IAEA, which was to try to establish a regime which would uh, prevent uh, the further spread of uh, military nuclear technology. Interestingly, this concern and this uh, uh, increased American emphasis on the control of nuclear technology uh, met the initiative taken by Ireland in 1959 to promote a non-proliferation treaty, which was more in a way a sort of a, a bottom-up approach of having originally countries sign up to a commitment not to acquire nuclear weapons uh, uh, and therefore building up the concept of non-proliferation by choice uh, from, uh, and this initiative, uh, this Irish initiative, the so-called Irish Resolution, was endorsed by many of the smaller players in the international community, especially within the non-aligned movement uh, uh, in particular. This is very much which, uh, what, combined with the fact that the Soviet Union itself became concerned with the issue, uh, primarily for, for two sets of reasons. The sort of lessons learned of the cooperation with China, which didn't necessarily prove uh, 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 successful from a Soviet perspective, but also very uh, uh, serious fears about a, a West German nuclear program at the time. Um, the, that the Soviet Union joined forces with the US uh, in, a, in, a force, in a form of what the, the French were then calling a condominium aimed at promoting uh, a, an arms control regime which included an, a non-proliferation treaty. Uh, so combined with the Irish initiative, this led to the sort of NPT quid pro quo, which is based on, on the famous three pillars, non-proliferation, nuclear cooperation, and arms control and disarmament, uh, combined with a, a, a regime which, and the, I think this is important to bear in mind as, uh, because this is the regime we're living, still living with, <coughs> was, was very much focused on a sort of very realist approach of the system as it did recognize, at least for an interim period, the existence of uh, five nuclear weapon states uh, and was trying to establish a verification regime uh, to make sure that the commitments by others would be fulfilled. Uh, and of course, this was combined with the other commitments uh, related to nuclear cooperation and nuclear disarmament. Uh, it is worthwhile to note, just to, to, to focus on the Europeans for a second, that the Europeans themselves were quite divided at the time. As I uh, hinted at, the, the French were critical and did boycott the NPT negotiation and uh, decided to stay out of the treaty uh, and, and did stay out of the treaty for more than, uh, for more than, 30, uh, more than 20 years, 25 years to be precise. Uh, and that choice, uh, but they also said that they would respect the principles enshrined in the treaty when, when it first came to signature. So, so it was a, a, uh, but it was a, 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 a critical position of the logic behind the NPT. Uh, the UK was on board from the very beginning as a depository, um, uh, and, uh, uh, which was a different position uh, for the, the other nuclear, European nuclear weapon state. Um, and the others were, did join the treaty, but sometimes, and this is worthwhile recalling, after rather serious domestic debates, uh, whether it was Sweden or Germany, for instance, it's interesting to, to uh, uh, note that Germany ratified the treaty only seven years after it was open for signature, meaning that the Bundestag had serious um, debates uh, about uh, the, 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 uh, whether the treaty was acceptable. And uh, in the same context, it was because of a German demand that, uh, that the NPT was originally uh, uh, signed for only 25 years. Uh, uh, so it was not, uh, at the time, the, the non-aligned insisting on that it was more uh, some of the allies of the United States. In the third period, uh, which starts with the entry into force of the treaty in 1970, I've, we see a, a, what you, you call the golden years, and, and it's true in many ways. Um, uh, this period of the first 25 years was a, a constant move towards universalization of the NPT 
and the establishment of a fairly robust non-proliferation norm. In this third period, the effort was very much put on this universalization effort, which enabled to move rather slowly but quite efficiently from a, a, a regime which was only covering uh, uh, about 90 signatories in, the, uh, uh, in 1968 to a regime which by uh, the time of the uh, a, a 95 conference on indefinite extension uh, had more than 180, at, at the time 178 part, uh, sig uh, signatories and uh, uh, has then since moved in the late 90s for most, for most of it uh, to a regime which covers almost the entire world, with a few exceptions, Israel being one of them, of course, but also India and Pakistan uh, being the only three countries that have never signed the NPT. Uh, in that period, the emphasis on universalization uh, was uh, uh, meant that there was a, a, a more limited uh, interest in the issue of compliance, because obviously most of the cases for concern were outside the treaty. So the uh, uh, premises was that if we convince country X, Y, or Z to join the treaty, they will afterwards uh, 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 implement it and uh, the problem will be solved. So the, the emphasis on universalization was quite logical in that context, uh, but meant that uh, maybe a less interest was paid to uh, compliance uh, as well. The uh, issue of disarmament was dealt with in the treaty with uh, uh, limited successes during that period, although, uh, of course, the, 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 the SALT agreements and, and others had a, had a positive impact, but it's only be, uh, at the end of the Cold War that the, the, the two issues did connect uh, very uh, uh, directly, uh, in, uh, in spite of the fact that it's worthwhile noting that uh, some NPT conferences already collapsed on the issue of a comprehensive test ban in the 80s, uh, so it's, uh, the, 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 debate were already, the debates were already there. In, as, uh, as the regime was evolving, it's, uh, it's interesting to note that in parallel, uh, the building up of the non-proliferation non norm was taking place also in terms of export control with the establishment of the nuclear suppliers group, uh, which, was, which is, in, from my perspective, a very uh, important element of that broader regime. In this period, the U.S. played a central role in this process, uh, uh, but the Europeans, including non-signatories of the NPTS France, were also very active in, in those negotiations uh, throughout uh, uh, the, 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 the 70s, 80s, and early 90s. It's uh, worthwhile pointing out the fact that the European community, even before it was the European Union, uh, was itself quite focused on the issue from the early years of what was to become the common and foreign and security policy. Uh, as early as 1990, the, Euro the European community was taking stance on, on the issue of non-proliferation uh, in spite of uh, uh, the differences amongst member states, uh, which were in indeed quite difficult to harmonize for a long time, uh, as France only joined the NPT in 1992, as I was um, uh, Hinting at. Uh, this period culminated with a run up to the 95 Review and Extension Conference with a major uh, sort of unprecedented diplomatic campaign led by the US administration, Ambassador Graham, for those who remember, uh, 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 traveling to almost uh, uh, 170 countries to convince them that they should sign up for indefinite extension of the NPT. And it, it's interesting to note that it was also one of the first major uh, achievement of the European Command and Foreign Security Policy to uh, uh, adopt a, a, a joint position, uh, a joint um, action on this, and to work towards the indefinite extension of the, of the treaty. So it's, a, it's a quite a, an interesting fact that the EU diplomacy, in, in a way, is, has been always very connected to these, these objectives. Um, this was a, a quite a success since uh, the, not only the treaty, uh, uh, the indefinite extension was adopted by consensus, but the, 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 the documents adopted at the time in 95 were, I believe, quite balanced and, and uh, with a, 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 a good emphasis on both a sort of disarmament agenda, uh, an emphasis on non-proliferation objectives, and uh, 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 on nuclear cooperation as well. Uh, of course, the, this was very much part of a package, and here we see 
issues that will uh, continue that continue to be on the agenda, such as the Middle East uh, resolution, which was uh, 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 part of that 95 package for indefinite extension. Interestingly, it's, uh, the, at the time, several countries joined the, the regime, such as Algeria, Argentina, South Africa, Ukraine, Brazil, which had had either a nuclear program or were considered as uh, uh, threshold states. So the, uh, again, we see the, the effect of these golden years. So let me wrap up with the, the, the present situation from the, the 90s to, to today. I think, I, see, I think we see, first of all, uh, and, and uh, uh, many of us have referred to that already uh, this, um, the, since we started this debate, uh, the, the emergence of the compliance challenge. Uh, we've seen, for the first time, uh, the clear demonstration that NPT member states have not complied with their non-proliferation obligations. And we've seen five concrete cases of a violation of their obligations by Iraq, DPRK, Libya, Iran, and Syria. Uh, of course, there were other more minor cases, but which were solved through uh, uh, the, the legal means, uh, uh, the, the, but the five first cases were clear cases of a violation of the commitment not to uh, uh, acquire or try to acquire nuclear weapons, uh, creating a, a, a very uh, central issue for the regime itself, uh, and uh, which is, I always insist on that, not only an arms control regime, but also a security regime, based on the assumption that when you sign the treaty, you have a good chance that your neighbors, uh, uh, which are signatories as well, will be uh, uh, will decide not to go nuclear uh, and will be uh, <coughs> uh, uh, will be forced to comply to that uh, commitment. Uh, in this case, we see five cases of non-compliance by signatories, uh, which has led the Western countries, especially the U.S. and European diplomacy, to put a new focus on the, on those non-compliance cases and to move into a, 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 a nuclear diplomacy very focused on uh, management of these nuclear crises, whether it's the uh, um, EU 3 plus 3 process on Iran or, or uh, uh, the dialogue around uh, North Korea. It also led to an effort within the IAEA to try to tackle this issue of non-compliance by uh, developing the 93 plus 2 program and comprehensive safeguards and allowing the agency to have a better insight at uh, 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 nuclear activities of uh, um, uh, uh, signatories. At the same time, it is worthwhile to note that the debate around uh, disarmament, nuclear disarmament, became more dividing both within the EU uh, uh, itself, between nuclear weapon states and non-nuclear weapon states, and some, sometimes amongst nuclear weapon states. Uh, meaning that the disarmament issue was becoming more contentious uh, 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 in the NPT framework itself uh, and uh, made the, the uh, NPT conferences more and more difficult to handle. Finally, uh, we see a, a globally a situation in which the Western countries, which have been very much pushing in favor of this regime, face a, 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 a more and more contentious demands with regard to nuclear cooperation, and, and sometimes uh, could be seen as rather isolated in this regime, in the defense of the regime uh, in all its three pillars. So let me conclude by uh, pointing at the challenges for tomorrow. First of all, um, I think there is a very much a need to rebuild a nuclear non-proliferation consensus or quasi-consensus uh, as it did exist uh, at, uh, at uh, many points in, in the history of the treaty. If you look at the 95 bargain, it was clearly the case. If you look at uh, uh, the 2000 NPT conference, there was also such a consensus. I'm not sure that the 2010 uh, review document, although it was also adopted by consensus, does offer such a base for, for a broader consensus as um, it was mentioned that it was sort of leaving aside some of the uh, most crucial issue uh, associated with the regime, namely Iran. So let me look at uh, the, the, the potential lines uh, for such a consensus, because I, I do, however, strongly believe that most of the NPT uh, signatories uh, do uh, uh, not only abide by the treaty, but 
uh, uh, abide by its uh, overall uh, overarching philosophy. Uh, the first point would be indeed the enforcement of the norm by addressing seriously non-compliance. What sort of price is there to pay for non-compliance? What are the consequences of non-compliance? And I think this is something that the NPT community has so far not been truly able to address uh, because of the rules uh, within the treaty, and, uh, but also because of the fact that it, it has become more convenient to evade the issue uh, in, in the NPT framework itself and to push it outside, whether it's in the IEA or in the UN Security Council. The second thing is there is a need to reinvent the bargain uh, um, around uh, peaceful uh, uh, users and access to technology uh, versus uh, verified compliance. And how do you uh, uh, accept and endorse the need for uh, others uh, to, to have ac access to nuclear technology uh, while making sure that there are no security uh, uh, dilemmas associated with that? Lastly, there is a need to develop the right disarmament agenda. And there, uh, there is, I think, an important debate to take place uh, on, on the right balance between the rhetoric of nuclear elimination, which have been very much part of the uh, last 10 years of uh, 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 NPT debates, uh, and the practical steps, which have been more abs absent in, in, in that period in many ways. Uh, uh, in spite of the effort of the NPT community to try to draft such an, an agenda of practical steps. So I will stop there uh, as we're leaving the historical backdrop and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Camille.